Hi there, I'm Dr. Barry Fitzgerald and you're very welcome to High Water, the science of flooding as part of the Midlands Science Festival for Science Week 2021. Now flooding is something that is in the news all of the time in Ireland, particularly in relation to the global climate change and the effect it's been having over the last few years. And today to talk to me about flooding and well, water in general, is someone who knows quite a bit about water, as we'll find out, and that is Associate Professor Rolf Hutz from the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. Rolf, great to have you here. Great to be here. Excellent. Can you maybe just tell some people about yourself, what you do at the Delft University of Technology? Yeah, so at Delft University, um, well, you, you you know me from uh, from your days in the Netherlands, uh, uh, Barry. Um, I'm mainly a tool builder, uh, is how I, I like to uh, present myself. Um, I work in the Department of Water Resources Engineering uh, and Hydrology, and uh, in that department, we are using at well, our entire research community is using things that we call hydrological models, models that help us understand and predict what is going on uh, on the surface of the earth uh, in the subsurface with water and i'm a tool builder the tools that i build are uh, software infrastructure that help other hydrologists to more easily work with each other's models um, well i'm also a tool builder in <laughs> making physical things my my, yeah. PhD, my phd was in uh, uh, building sensors to measure uh, climate related variables by taking apart consumer electronics and see if you can make these things uh, at a lower cost than we're, than we're currently doing. Well, that's a very, uh, very circular approach towards developing devices to uh, assess the environment and to assess, as you say, the, uh, the, issues the, in the, relation the, to, to water. The reason that we did that is um, if you look at the current devices that scientists use or that operational offices that monitor the state of uh, water systems, the state of weather and climate, uh, they're using high-end professional devices, which is logically given the assignment that they have. These are expensive. Um, and as everybody know, if you just like walk around town, the amount of rain can vary between you and your neighbors. So sometimes it's more, uh, it tells us more about what's going on if we can have multiple, maybe lower cost, maybe uh, less accurate sensors distributed than if we just have one very high quality sensor. Yeah, yes. Well, in, in consumer electronics, especially the last 40 years, uh, there has been a reducing cost in sensors. Uh, there's now sensors in your game controllers for your uh, game console. There are sensors in, in particularly uh, all these nice mobile phones are packed with sensors. And because these are produced in, uh, in, in the billions currently, uh, the cost per sensor has gone down and we're trying to siphon off of that to uh, to benefit the climate community well i think that's a, a very responsible and sustainable approach now before we get into all the technical stuff which we'll we'll get into in a few moments i guess i a lot of people are going to want to know why did you decide to get into research on water and hydrology <laughs> uh, happenstance i think Is that, isn't that how most careers happen um i did my master's in uh, physics um, actually, my uh, my MSc thesis is about the how the inner ear, the human inner ear, is capable of uh, distinguishing different frequencies. So <laughs> it's kind of a different uh, field. But during my MSc, with a group of fellow students, we wanted to go on an internship outside of the building. I mean, we were physics students. <laughs> It's atypical, but we actually wanted to go outside of the building. Yeah, I've been um, there. I'm the same as you, a physics background and all it's like. You, you know, if you get out of the building, it's it's a massive day out, right? Yes. And um, <clears throat> so we asked around where we could do an internship, um, not in the Netherlands, preferably uh, not in Europe. And we were sent to civil engineering, where for historic reasons, water management is located in the Netherlands. So uh, I got in touch with people at civil engineering. We got in touch and they sent us to, uh, to Kenya to study the behavior of groundwater around submerged dams. Um, 
which is which which they do over there they they dig uh in a um in a river bed they dig in and then they pour in concrete so you have like a groundwater dam and during the rainy season the river will run and it will saturate the package of sand upstream of the dam um and then during the dry season you basically have a confined package of water that's in the ground that you can then just get out it won't contaminate etc and, and the question that was asked for us as well as a bunch of physicists uh, can you just have a look at whether this works as intended uh, can you do some modeling on it etc and that's how I got into this field um, and then after I finished my MSc I kind of st stuck uh, I did some stint I, I worked in the Bureau of Statistics for uh, for the Netherlands doing social welfare statistics for a while but then i get got back uh, into academia um, to do my phd on that sensor design uh, topic i just talked about yeah, so, so you... it's all over the place and now i'm an associate professor in this field oh the very interesting trajectory to go from the ear to statistics to uh, water and hydrology and i guess one other important question that i'm going to ask you now i live in the netherlands you live in the netherlands We'll talk about this later on, but could you just let people know where do you live in the Netherlands? Oh, um, so th uh, this is recorded in the beautiful town of Haarlem. Here, um, let me see how this works. Uh, somewhere over there, you can see the, the train track and the wires above the train track. So this is the roof of my neighbor. Um, I, I don't think I have a typical view of uh, the flatness that is uh, the surrounding area here. Um, but the city of Haarlem uh, is nicely located uh, on the edge of the old dunes, some um, peat systems. Then the city of Haarlem is sitting on a sand ridge. And then the classic polder systems, like the uh, lakes that we've drained to create more land, are just to the east uh, of us. Right. Well, I, where I live, I live in Marsen at the moment. and. I'm quite close to quite a lot of polder lands and I can see it in the names of the towns. <laughs> oh, yeah. Molen, Molen Polder kind of gives it away. Uh, we'll get into that a, a little bit later on. But first of all, let's jump into your own research, the kind of things you're doing at the moment at the Delft University of Technology. And that's in relation to modeling and predicting of floods. Now, you actually mentioned something about computer models earlier on when you were talking about the work you've already done around the time of your master's. Can you maybe just expand on the type of modeling and predicting that you're working on? Yeah, so, uh, of course, I can talk for hours on this. Um, <laughs> we don't have hours, though. Okay, we don't I'll, have hours. I'll keep it short. Um, in, um, in science in general, we use models for generally speaking, two purposes. We construct a model, and a model can be like a mathematical representation of what we think the world works like. Uh, but it can also be that same mathematics translated into computer code so that we can, can uh, calculate what the works, or world works like. And the first reason we do that is to better understand the actual working of the world. That's what we as scientists are usually interested in. How does, in our case, how does rainfall lead to water in a river? Uh, so, so we have people in our community researching, okay, if rainfall falls on the ground, how much of it actually gets infiltrated? How much of it gets flowing over land? And that distinction, what does it depend on? Is, is soil type dominant or is the wetness state of the ground dominant? And can we then capture what we see into a model, into a mathematical and a computer model, so that we better understand what happens? And then that model becomes a hypothesis in itself. So we can say, okay, now we think this is how it works. Then we take that model to another location, to a different soil type or to another rainstorm, maybe a more intense one. And we do measurements again and we see if the model predicts our measurements and if it doesn't we'll adjust the model so that it then fits both situations the original one and the new one and in that way we converge upon a better understanding of the actual physics the actual working of this earth system that we're trying to understand so that's the, the first real big reason to do this but then the second big reason, and that's mainly in, in engineering universities like my own, 
is that these models also serve a purpose in predicting the future. If we have confidence that these models are any good, and by doing what I just described, continuously improving them based on new observations coming in, if we have confidence that these are working as intended, then we can also use them to say, okay, this is where we are now. We understand the mathematics of what's going on. Can we predict what will happen tomorrow? Day after, etc., etc. And in that case, we're using the models to predict will this river flood in a week? Will we have to do something? Will we have to evacuate the city, etc.? And that's the more operational side of, uh, of water management. The research that I personally do, and I say personally, but research is always done collaborative. Uh, the, the idea of a lone genius doing research is, uh, is very, very false. One, we're not lone, and two, we're usually not geniuses. No, um, no, there's, there's, there isn't that many Tony Starks around the place working by themselves, building something. Tony Stark, Tony Stark isn't a genius. Tony Stark is a, is a billionaire philanthropist. He should just be taxed instead of, etc. But that's a different discussion. <laughs> well, I'm um, a big fan of Tony Stark, to be honest. But I, what I will say I, is I'm that... A, I I'm, a, he, I'm a big fan of corporate taxation. Yeah. <laughs> well, I will say, I'm pretty sure he was paying his corporate taxes. He should, but uh, maybe just in a little more creative manner. But what I would say is that what he does is a little bit unrealistic. And what you just said there, exactly that. You need to collaborate with teams. I've been yes. in those research teams before. And you yourself have a team with you, of course, to work on all of this. Yeah, well, it's not my team. I'm part. Of, I always consider it part of a team, and I maybe I'm the most outspoken or extroverted part of the team, <laughs> so the people know me better. I don't know that, but the, 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 every player in the team uh, is very important to, to get where we want to go. And where we want to go is that in the community of uh, researchers working on making hydrological models, what you usually see is that there's a lot of models available, and and they're slightly different. So. Uh, people in, uh, in University One would have a model that focuses mainly on, okay, we're in Norway, we want to make sure that we get the fjords right, because those are very important to us. And yeah, well, flatlands, flatlands are easy. We'll just model them with one parameter and done. Whereas in the Netherlands, we would be like, who needs fjords? We, we need flatlands. Uh, and they need to be like very well described, because that's very important. Uh, and so what you then end up with is that there's a whole collection of models. And what usually happens is that we start taking these models sometimes even out of their context. So we're like, okay, we've developed this for this context. Now I want to upscale it to the entire world. Can I? Um, and there's, there's, this is one reason why there's different models, but there's a ton of other reasons why there could be different models as well. Um, sometimes you just want to make a better one than the previous one. Sometimes you just course, want to yes. uh, write it in a, in a new programming language that's more efficient. The result is that there is a bunch of models. And it's given how complex these are, it's really hard for one group of researchers that works with one model to switch to the other one or even to compare to the other one. And that's where my research comes in. So we're building the tools that makes it a lot easier for my fellow researchers to work with each other's models on very big data sets. So that if you're running an experiment, for example, uh, I want to see what the impact of climate change is on this region with this hydrological model. And then, then you can look at how often will this region flood? How often will we experience drought? Um, that's, that's one, very relevant. Two, very hard to do currently. Once you've done it, you basically also want to do, okay, what would be the impact if I use one of the other models? And what I want to make sure is that that is just changing a few lines of code instead of hiring another person for a year, etc. So that's what my research is about. Well, I just want to go back to something actually there in relation to when you're building models. I have a computational physics background and what I did was I did simulations on sand particles. <laughs> And I condensed sand particles down to their absolute essential necessity, which is that they are either there or not there, ones or zeros. And I had the particles interacting with each other subject to what were called binary interactions based on <coughs> ones and zeros. So no forces at play and simply implementing them as dots and hoping that I could recover all of the rich behaviors that you see in the real world. Now with your models, when are you sure, or if you can ever be sure, 
that you have all of the necessary details to capture what you want to try and capture. In other words, when do you kind of say, okay, we've taken that into account, we've taken that into account, they're important. But factor number three, I think we can safely leave that out because we don't need to put that in. How do you decide what needs to be in the models and where's the line drawn? Or is it ever drawn? No, it's never drawn. Uh, and it shouldn't be. Because um, the, so, so uh, we have uh, uh, people in our community like you working on uh, individual behavior of sand in sediment in rivers. Uh, we have people working on how, how water seeps through the soil uh, at a, a nanometer scale. Um, however, um, I think there's, there's famous uh, scientists and equations that look at the amount of uh, grains of sand and co in, in, in one given beach and compare it to the amount of stars in the sky, etc. Yep. And then compare it to the amount of um, memory that all the computers in the world have combined and it wouldn't fit. So, so we will never be able to put all the grains of sand into a computer. There might be people from a more uh, literature background that would argue that you could build like a replica earth and then and then use that as a simulation but then you would need the mice to be the system administrators and it's a whole mess um so so but basically you cannot capture that like quantum physics level behavior into a model that tries to predict what the rhine is doing on a day-to-day -day scale so you have to make uh, uh aggregated assumptions there yes of course and, yeah um the 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 real trick is, do you go bottom up or top down? Explain, well, explain to people what bottom up <clears throat> and top down means, because some people might realize what that means in the world of computer modeling. So uh, if you want to go bottom up, you start with those grains of sand. I say, okay, I know that one grain of sand interacts with this other grain of sand in this way. So what if I take a hundred grains of sand, a thousand, etc.? Do I see a relation? Can I then, can I then just model the relation instead of modeling the individual grains of sand? Uh, and usually you can, for example, in the in the case of grains of sand, what comes out of it would be Darcy's law. Um, yes. yeah. with Darcy's law basically says for a given package of sand or soil, uh, how much water can flow through it for a given pressure difference. Darcy's sand includes something called hydraulic conductivity, which is a parameter for that given type of sand, type of packaging, etc. And here comes the problem. If you then use Darcy's law, do you keep that parameter constant? If you upscale from your your understanding at the very fine scale, if you upscale to, well, we are using pixels of one by one kilometer in uh, in global hydrological models. Just so people understand, yeah. So people understand what that basically means is that you are simulating a large area of land on a grid and you are a, a taking a point, a data point from a kilometer by kilometer area. That's correct? Yeah, well, so we're assuming that within that one by one grid, the sand is homogeneous. Whereas no, in reality, <laughs> we know it isn't. I, mean, just I definitely know it's not homogeneous. <laughs> and, so, and so the question is, is that relevant enough for your prediction? And then the question is, what do you want to predict? And, and here we get into the, uh, the distinction between models to model reality and models to predict the future, which not, is not necessarily the same. So, because if I want to predict a, a aspect of the future, for example, river discharge, the amount of water in a river, I could say it is okay enough if I just want to have a 15 day horizon in my predictions to assume that this part of the river bad is homogeneous sand. But I know it's not true. And so th that's one of the things that makes um, uh, earth sciences, in my uh, opinion, so interesting compared to, for example, physics. <laughs> Uh, in physics, what you have? How dare you! How dare you uh, mock physics? <laughs> well, it's very simple. If you have an, if you have a setup in physics and you want to measure the mass of an electron, you get a certain number out of it, and you take your setup, and you take it from your lab in uh, Marse, and you yeah. bring it, and you bring it to Zurich, uh, to, uh, uh, and you're going to measure again. You'd better yes. measure the exact same thing because the mass of an electron should be the same, and if it's not accurate enough. You just get you just get a more expensive machine. Whereas in earth sciences, if I have measured the amount of rain 
falling in the uh, Rhine catchment. And I have constructed a model that can predict the amount of water that ends up in the river. And it includes terms for the amount of evaporation, the amount of groundwater flow, all these components are in there. I take that model and I bring it to the Congo. It's probably not going to work. Yeah, because it's because it's such a different system, but it's yes. the same physics going on. Yeah. Um, and so how can we make sure? And it's one of the big questions in, in earth sciences is which of these processes are what we call global and which are locally determined and what kind of local knowledge do you need to make adequate local predictions? So, so then so then just thinking, you know, ideally, imagine that there was a Sims version of a model that could predict flooding in any part of the world and it's you know you know the game for the sims you can build cities and you can have whatever you want there you know put a nuclear power station in the middle of a runway at an airport whatever takes your fancy imagine that then there was a sims variant for flooding where you include these elements that would be the local and the global components now will that will that ever be the case will there ever be this universal program that i as someone who's an hydrologist wants to go okay so i want to model flooding in in, in related to the shannon in ireland i want to see how it affects places like athlone or I want to see how it affects other places downstream and with the same model the same program by just changing a couple of the parameters or the couple of things i have to take into account i could model uh, flooding in the congo will that ever happen um these models exist, um, so, so so groups are working on that. And, and so so the program that I work in is called eWater Cycle, um, and this is exactly the kind of thing that we're working towards to make that uh, to make that accessible to uh, both researchers and operational water managers, and at some point maybe people uh, people in the public that want to play sim like games. And I, I know for sure that you're going to try to flood your neighbors, etc. It's going to be fun. <laughs> Um, no, so that's exactly what we're working towards. There are some models that already do this where, uh, so for example, Deltares is a Dutch, um, knowledge Institute, I should say. Yeah. It's a Dutch knowledge Institute related to Delta technology, water, etc. And, uh, they have one of these models where you could basically say, now I want to generate a version of this model for this region. Um, however, as we've recently uh, shown, that model performs differently for different types of landscapes. Um, and what, what most likely is going on there is, like I said a few moments ago, uh, hidden assumptions you make about what you think are important processes will be in that model. So it means that in landscapes where these assumptions hold true, your model will probably perform better compared to in landscapes where those assumptions do not hold true. But there's another thing going on, and that is uh, these models need local data. So for example, the, the topography is very important. The soil types are very important, uh, but we also need to know things about climatology. What is the average rain we can expect here? So there's, there's a whole bunch of different statistics and background information about your region that we would need to know to make that model suitable for that region. And that is not equally distributed on the earth, the amount of data available. So maybe you in Ireland have a, a data system where for the Shannon, you could just say, okay, what is the geological features? Where do I have karst versus clay? Um, I'm pretty sure we don't have that for the Congo. That's, that's a very nice bridge now into the next section because you're saying that with these models in which you want to simulate perhaps future flooding conditions on perhaps the short to medium term, that you need to have access to that local data. And that data, of course, can be collected by dedicated researchers, or it could be collected as part of a citizen science approach. Before maybe talking about the citizen science approach, what type of sensors would you as researchers who are on in the field need to to build or to have access to. So what type of data are you measuring that can be inputted into these models? Yeah, so we have to make a separation in these models between, and it gets a bit technical here, but bear with me. Um, That's we okay. Have, we'll, we have, we'll, we'll have, <laughs> think of the viewer and keep it as non-technical yeah. as possible. <laughs> we'll have to make a separation here between the things that we call uh, parameters and the things that we call state variables. 
Um, and so, what's, so what's a parameter and what's a state variable? Yeah, so a parameter is a, um, a piece of information that a model needs, but that is not necessarily changing over time. And for example, soil type or and characteristics of the soil, given that you don't take erosion, et cetera, into account, um, is a parameter. So you could say, okay, this area uh, here is clay at, at the topsoil, which is very important to know because of the way it infiltrates our runoffs. And this clay has a hydraulic conductivity of so and so much. What we need to know is this area has uh, trees of this type, which given so much water will evaporate so much or will intercept in their canopy so much. Um, so those are parameters we need to know. State variables are the actual things that change over time and that the model either needs as an input or that it calculates continuously and that we would need to measure to see if the model is behaving correctly. So uh, as an input for most hydrological models, the most important state uh, input variable would be precipitation, the amount of rainfall falling on a catchment. Um, if you want to do future predictions, like are we going to flood in the next two weeks, of course, you cannot ask people to measure the rain in two weeks. So then we would need no, the of course then, not. then we would need a weather forecast for that. Um, and but, but then, but then actually, you make that's a very good point because a weather forecast is also a prediction. So you're taking a prediction and then feeding a prediction into a model yes. to predict. And, uh, and, and, so and, some and, people and, might think that's kind of a you know a bit ironic. So is no, there any no, way no, to? No, no, no. But that's very important here. That so the weather forecast is also a model which also takes inputs. And so the weather forecast is an atmospheric model and the flood forecast is a hydrological model. Um, and these interact with each other. And um, what I always like to use as a comparison, the way that we do operational forecasting, whether for weather or for flood, but for weather it's easy to, to understand, is um, we run a model forward in time from the point where we are now as a prediction. Most people know that weather models are chaotic or actually the weather system is chaotic. So, so a small deviation in your knowledge about where we are in time will at some point bloom out into a large error in your prediction. If you then again go further and just do statistics, then it condenses again into climate statistics. But on, on, on that short time scale, like, like the week's time scale that the weather model usually runs for, yes, yeah. small deviations end up being chaotic. The, the more accurate we know where we currently are, the longer in time we can predict before it blows up. And that's where, where real-time observations comes in. Because every time we start a new run of the weather prediction, which feeds into the flood prediction, every time we start that, we want to know as accurately as possible where we need to start. So we would need to know what was the actual rainfall that, that fell here. We need to know how wet is the soil actually here? What is the actual temperature here? So that we can start our models from as close to the truth as we can get. And there's a whole field of science that's adjacent to mine, which is called the data simulation which is the mathematics of getting the most accurate estimate of the truth at one point given your observation because sensors also have uncertainty so given your observation and given yesterday's prediction because there's there's value in yesterday's prediction there's of value course. in your observation what is the best estimate of what was actually going on on the ground as a starting point for your prediction that you're going to run today and that is why we need more data to get accurate uh, forecasting. And but in the but case that's, of... that's all only the operational side of the, the, the question. If you want to have another way to improve the accuracy is to have better models. So I have, yeah. have the representation of the system, the physics, etc., in the models be better than they currently are. And for that, we also need uh, all of the same type of uh, measurements as I just described. So precipitation, uh, water in the river, water in the soil, types of soil, so that we can have a look at 
where are our models not agreeing but what we actually seeing on the ground and where do we need to improve but that's a slower iteration process than the real-time iteration of predictions so for the models with something that you mentioned earlier on in relation to sensors that you would have in, in a catchment area of a city where you have a very highly accurate sensor it would be better to have it distributed over a larger area a number yes. of sensors that can measure this these fluctuations and changes in this local environment and let's just imagine that you have a town that's on the Shannon in Ireland for example like Athlone and, and there's a, a number of, of residents there who are concerned about issues in relation to flooding how could perhaps theoretically they get involved in in collecting data and then if they were collecting the data who can they send that data to so who would be open to receiving such data and and ideally how many people would you want to have involved would you want to have everyone involved or would you say actually we just need to have a data point or a collect collection of these these data points precipitation soil soil uh, moisture maybe temperature etc at different locations across across that particular area near the shannon so what's the ideal method for this and how can people actually get that data to people who are actually going to use it um so if you look at the the way that these data is ingested in these prediction systems, um, it's very important for the ones running these operational models to have a very accurate sense of what the uncertainty in those um, in those measurements are. Because if you uh, overrepresent a measurement, you could just pull the prediction towards that measurement, um, and you, okay. you you wouldn't you wouldn't want to evacuate a town because someone just misread um uh, what's that in english a tape measure yeah 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 measuring tape yeah yeah, yeah um yeah. so um so what you what you would need is a um, scale of measurements from very high accurate professional ones where you maybe just have a few yes to distributed measurements where citizens contribute um where you understand what the uncertainty of these measurements is also accept that and then take that into account uh, when uh, streaming that into your model what we currently see is that most citizen science projects feed into the science side where we use them to make better models and well and they and they are not yet used in directly feeding into operational decision making and there's a there's a legal uh, issue there um you want to hold your government responsible for their actions, right? So, sure. it, so if your government says, okay, this is the prediction for flooding in this region, and it's based on these measurements, etc., um, would you would you would you feel comfortable if these if these measurements were made by your neighbor? Um, I think I mean some people get on with their neighbors, and, yes. and some people would trust their neighbors, and other people actually might have a fallen out over a fence issue or, or a hedge uh, element, and they may not trust said neighbor in relation to the sharing of accurate yeah. data for and these so, models. But, but there, but there are ways to work with this. Uh, for example, in the Netherlands, there's a, and I think most countries have this. There is a voluntary uh, service where it used to be all farmers, by the way. Every day you read out a measurement cup, like like a physical cup that's just sitting outside in, in your uh, uh, garden. Yes. You read it out, you, f you phone in the amount of millimeters of rain and you empty it. And you do that exactly the same time of day each day. Uh, and I think you get a, I don't know, bottle of wine or a nice thing once a year as a thank you. But the... Um, this service is run by the Dutch branch of uh, the Meteorological Institute, so it's KNMI sure. in the Netherlands. Yeah. Um, they come and check upon if this thing is correctly placed, if it's in the right place, etc. And they have a problem that basically their volunteers are dying out. This is not something that a young generation wants to do. So like wake up every day, 8 a.m., go read the thing, call up also the, the reason it's calling up is because the volunteers in this network are not comfortable using computers i was just going to say that it's a generational thing yes yeah. no for sure and and they yeah. really and so, yeah. and so and so they really have a problem of keeping this uh, network uh up and running it would of course be really great if they could and they're working on that if they could just like put electronic sensors in these places 
of course that automatically center but then you and, and you're running kind of a dilemma here you want to have these things next to each other for a very long time before you phase out the old ones because if you have your timeline climate changes over decadal scales meteorology is one of the few fields where we have time series going back a century and it's basically because we're kind of conservative in not jumping to the newest device directly. And I've, I've struggled with that as someone that makes new devices. Um, and I've come to understand at least the reasons behind it is that yeah, if you phase out these old devices and you see, you see a trend shift for something, is that because you have a new device that is just slightly measuring differently? Or is that because the underlying phenomena like rain has changed over time and you need to be very sure what your what your claims are um, so if the uh, irish equivalent of the uh, meteorological institute has a, a program Mace like Aaron. that yeah um, is the name of the institute th that would be that would most likely be the institute for uh, citizen science rainfall projects to be initiated that directly feed into uh, the prediction system um, however if you want to contribute to building that knowledge base uh, to have better models that then are run on the more professional sensors that are operated yes. by professionals, yeah. then you could still get in contact with uh, preferably local universities that run hydrological pro uh, programs. There's a few really good ones in Ireland. Um, most likely they'll have uh, citizen science pro uh, projects They'd be really happy to work with people that say, look, I, I want to measure a rainfall time series in my backyard. Would it benefit you? Um, especially in the time of open data and open science that we're currently in, uh, these things are appreciated more and more. Uh, so yeah, just just get in touch with these uh, with these programs. And I'm sorry for my colleagues in Ireland if this spams their inboxes. <laughs> well, I'm sure, to be honest, they're probably going to be really happy to see people proactively becoming involved in the whole data collection elements. And even, I think, even for people who are just interested, perhaps they could set up the sensors and the collection devices in their back gardens or on their grounds of their home and get practice even just taking the measurements and seeing what it's like to be part of the scientific process and then yeah. get to a point where they're comfortable measuring it and then they can start sending and contributing the data. I think that that's a really nice a really nice way yeah, to and, get and, and, the people and, involved. And, and the threshold of doing that has become lower and lower. Uh, yes, so in, course, in Delft, yeah. we've worked with a startup. Uh, I, should, I should look up the name. I'll provide you with the name so you can put it in screen or something. Yeah, um, sure, I'll do that. Where, we, um, where they basically leverage the technology in mobile phones. Um, and they, they just provide people with a very standard cup to measure rainfall, what, what they ask them is to not read it out themselves because human reading error is bigger than most phones. So just make a picture, upload it, and they'll do some processing on it to there read out. Go, yeah. um, and, uh, and, and since they also, the phone knows the location, they know, okay, now we have a measurement here. Um, mobile water or something. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll send it to you. And Check so, it off. That's okay. That's no problem. But it's, yeah. it's also um, an emerging field in science is how to do good science, citizen science project. Because it's, it's not just citizens handing over their data to scientists and then be done with it. The, the program should uh, take into account the, about the concerns and the stakes of the people providing the data, give feedback on what the outcomes of the project are and involve them really in uh, in the process um, and luckily that is also uh, really improving uh, lately absolutely yeah it's fantastic to see that too I, I, I was keeping track on some of the things that have been going on just in, in relation to that so i can see that there is positive movements towards that right the last thing that we'd like to just have a chat about uh, rolf is living with flooding and this is more about the fact that you were living in Harlem. We, we saw Harlem out the window there earlier on. And could you maybe just very quickly delve into a little bit of what it's been like to, to live in Harlem? Because I think you're born and bred Harlem, never left Harlem, or maybe you did just to just to go a couple of places around the world. Um, you live uh, you live below sea level, just for people to understand no, that. Is that no, correct no, no. or close to it? Not, not yet. We're getting there. So... Uh... <laughs> 
So I was I was I was raised below sea level. So I was raised in the village of Zwanenburg, which most people in the Netherlands know because it's directly on the uh, in, in the path of one of the major runways of Schiphol Airport. Oh uh, right, yes, yeah, I know it. Yeah, yeah. Um, which which as a as a positive side means I can sleep anywhere. I don't care about noise. Um, <laughs> wow, I mean, but, I'm not the same. <laughs> but um, uh, uh, Zwanenburg is in the Haarlemmer Meerpolder, which is one of these big lakes that was drained. It was the second to last one, if you count the IJsselmeer, the Flevopolder. Um, it was drained. It was the first one to be drained with steam engines. Um, I think I grew up at minus three mean sea level, and the deepest point is at minus five. Um, that's, I think that's right. Yeah, minus so minus three meters. Just you know, that's yeah. um, so, so you're about one. Your height is about one seventy eight, seventy nine, one eighty, something yeah. like that. Is that right? So basically, basically, if um, uh, if I was to bike to Harlem where I live now, which is like a ten kilometer bike ride, the first thing to get out of town was to get up the levee, because there's a canal around the old lake. Which, yes. ba which basically they used. So, so if you want to drain a lake, what you do is you dig a canal around it. And then you uh, dig a canal from that canal towards the sea and whatever. And, and, and there's a whole series of pumps in between, of course. And then you just start pumping the lake into the canal and then the canal into the sea. But the canal is still there. And because that lake is below sea level, if the sea is somewhere over here and, and the current new land is somewhere over here, uh, even if there's dunes and dikes in between here, there's still groundwater pushing upwards here. So you have a negative groundwater pressure. So it's basically coming up here. <laughs> and yeah. um, that means that uh, we call it quell in Dutch. Uh, that needs to be pumped out. So it's constantly pumping. Yeah, but it's not at a rate that it's not like if the pumps stop, we have to immediately start running. Luck, luck. <laughs> yeah, that and, and that's actually, what that's what people would like to know about. Of course, I I know in and, the Netherlands. And, and actually, actually, it's it's so if you look at summertime, uh, yeah. uh, the amount of evaporation from the soil is more than the quell. From, so we have to let in fresh water to make sure that crops and grasslands uh, don't dry up or that they don't suck up too much of that groundwater because because ultimately that's coming from the sea, so that's very salt. So you want to yes, have yeah. so you want to have a freshwater lens to make sure your your some of the cheeses in the Netherlands in the Beemster for example are known for being a little bit salty because those are polders where there's more quell coming up so the grass that grows there is a little bit more salty than uh, you would expect. Um, of course, in in the Netherlands, I do know from from living here for quite some time that you often get alerts of hoogwater, or that's high water. Uh, with some of the rivers, and um, this this is something that we I've, I've seen many many times on the news. And has there ever been such a hogwater uh, alert or, or emergency, let's say, during your time in Harlem? No, because so Harlem has the benefit of being on one of the sand ridges that's between the polar systems and the sea. So there's there's a few north south running sand ridges, and the last one is our coastal defense, the dunes. Uh, Harlem is on one of the older ones. I think the foundation of my house is at plus 30 centimeters mean sea level. Um, <laughs> it's pretty high up. That's uh, pretty. I mean, that is dizzying uh, height. You know, you're thinking oxygen tank stuff here, like, you know, 30 centimeters. Oh, if I if I need to go east of uh, Utrecht, then I usually bring uh, oxygen. No, it's... Uh, <laughs> no, so, so, but the, the, um, the, the thing is, the, the canals are higher so the water level in the canals is higher than the level where the houses are built in the polder you you must have seen it if you bike around one of these yeah. one of these dikes that go around these polders if you look yes, to the yeah. left you see you see water uh, at like 10 centimeters below you and if you look to the right you see houses 3 meters below you so that that's weird and discomforting um we well we trust the system but the most flooding we can get um, the most flooding we've had recently is not from this polar system. It's it, the, the flooding we get is from upstream uh, rivers that run through our country and that need to drain at some point uh, into the sea, uh, basically bringing too much water from 
Germany, Belgium, etc. Yes, uh, this, yeah. su- this summer we had major floods both in Germany, uh, Belgium, and parts of the Netherlands because we just had too much water, rainwater coming in than the that these little rivers could handle. And then there's two types of uh, flooding danger in in the more hilly part of the Netherlands. I mean, I say hilly. I think the highest point is 300 meters, but bear with me. Three, 322 meters, I think. Um, and, it's, Val- and, and, it's, and it's on the border. Yeah, Val- Valsberg. It's another oh. thing called the, the, the Drie Landen Punt, which is the three lands point, which actually it shares its border with Belgium and Germany for people who want to know. And, <laughs> and, and okay, and the road going there is called, yes. it's called the Four Land Road. Because there, there was a fourth country there, yeah. And you, and and so anyone interested should uh, check out uh, Tim the Traveler, who has an amazing YouTube channel and an amazing uh, series about that point. Um, having said that, so in the hilly part, uh, we have what we call classic <laughs> hydrology. The hilly part. Well, it basically, yeah. so the, the assumption yeah. in classic hydrology is water moves down under gravity. Sure. And that and so in the hilly part, that holds true. Um, and so the flooding there would be if a valley and, and a river bed in a valley needs to process more water than it can handle and it will run its banks. But those banks are usually sloping up, so it will just go over and over and over. And, and I guess for most of the, the pictures I've seen from uh, the Irish countryside, this would be kind of similar. But then you, you come at a point in the delta where, where you start hitting those polder systems, the very flat systems. Um, and what happens there is we've built levees over time to make sure that the river stays in place, but the land beside it either has subsided or always was a little bit lower. Yes. So, yeah. so basically you have a main channel where you want to, where you want to flush out all that water towards the sea. But if you get a flooding there, you get overtopping of a levee. And that's a whole different process and a whole different set of dangers associated with it. Um, most of our flood defenses for river flooding are in that part of the country. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So for the Delta project that you refer to, for people who don't know where that is in the Netherlands, that's in the, the, the province of Zeeland. Yeah, uh, no, the, Delta, is... the Delta project protects against flooding from the sea. Yeah. Um, and, and these are river uh, river levees that protect against flooding from rivers overtopping. And, which and, are coming from water from Germany, Belgium and other countries. And, yeah. and so the thing that is uh, especially dangerous is if these two conditions happen at the same time. So you get a lot of yeah. water coming. So that we call the compound flooding. People in uh, Amsterdam are doing a lot of research into this. So we have uh, high water coming in from the river and high water from storm systems because usually that high water is generated by a storm system raining out chances are you also have that same storm system at sea um that those are the really tricky situations where we we put in things like guards on levees to make sure that they don't overtop um but that luckily hasn't happened in a while Oh. It hasn't, yeah. And I mean, it's quite clear from what you're talking about here that the, the, the Netherlands, unsurprisingly, are quite good when it comes to water management. So just to conclude then, in terms of everything we've looked at, we've looked at computer modeling, we've looked at the data science and the element of collected data, and then we've looked at your own experience and heard about the the history of water management in terms of, of the Netherlands and, and how the Netherlands has, has, has managed to capture lands and and to live with this what would you say to people in ireland where you know flooding is 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 definitely a concern at the moment in ireland it's happening quite frequently now there's a lot of factors involved what would you say just in general as an expert in hydrology to people in ireland in relation to this um i'd be hesitant to give on the floor advice and that is because what we talked about at the start is this locality um i grew up in this system I know the basic global laws of how water moves around and I know the local knowledge that would help me understand the local system in the Netherlands. Um, the local system in Ireland has its own particularities. It has its own soil types. It has its own different. So the, the biggest advice I could give them is to either educate themselves, but more likely get in touch with or get lessons from local experts on uh, hydrology and water management that understand how the interaction between a global changing climate and a local system that you have in place is. 
um, there's there's more than enough uh, data and computer power available to calculate what would happen in any given locale with the changing climate. So are you going to have? So we know and we can look up if the Shannon River is going to get more intense rainfall or maybe more subdued rainfall over time with climate change. And then someone with a local model that is adequate for the Shannon River. And I would not presume to have that, but I know it exists. No problem. I'm sure it does. Can can calculate what the impact would be. And then you can start looking as a community. OK, maybe we shouldn't we should not want to um, how do you say that politely? Maybe we should not want to live here. Maybe we should not build new houses here. Maybe we should put up more defenses because we can expect over the coming 10, 20, 50, 100 years for this particular spot to be flooding more and more. And one very important thing that I think needs mentioning here, uh, it takes a village is what they say in English, I guess. Uh, in water management, uh, what we say is it takes a basin. Um, so if, if you solve this at the very local town community level, you're running in some kind of a prisoner's dilemma. And this has happened in the United States a lot um, because well, the United States are known for their fierce local uh, governments, um, which have uh, not on a basin level, but on like a county, I think it's called in the States, county level. Yeah, they've got county levels there. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so what if at a county level you decide like okay, we need more defenses because we know that this is going to flood more often so we're going to put higher levees in place if a flood wave comes through you're going to be protected but that same flood wave is going to go as what we call a plug flow going to go hit the next one downstream whereas if your defense would be okay what if we designate parts where this flood can actually flood that we that we allow to in the extreme case once a five years once every 10 years to inundate because it because it's only grassland or we can evacuate mm -hmm. it in time etc then that same plug flow flood that's coming down would be spread out and downstream it would have a lower uh, a peak height and peak height is what causes your damage downstream they probably have multiple rivers coming in if everybody upstream it's just raising their own individual riverbanks that downstream they and it becomes an arms race uh, instead of a collaboration so and since the netherlands is located at the drainage of the muse and the rhine uh, we have international collaborations with the other countries there to make sure that decisions taken along these um, rivers burdens are equally spread etc and that's D d d d diplomats need to come in to play there to do that on a uh, on a good level but d d d uh, f river flooding is never the problem of one village it's always the problem of a basin so so yep. solve it at a basin level i think that's a very good way to end actually to say that it's not all about a local environment while well, we did talk about the local measurements etc that it needs to be a collaborative effort something you talk about in relation to your work in order to get this to be solved that everyone needs to work together towards the common goal right i think we're done in relation to high water the science of flooding uh rolf associate professor rolf Hutz from the delft university of technology Thanks very much for taking the time to have a chat. I think we could have spoken literally for <laughs> hours about this and maybe we'll get the opportunity to do so again in the near future. But thanks very much for taking the time to chat to us today. Thanks for having me.